be much more dilute. And again, we get a lot of rain out here, so we're not looking to capture all of the rainwater on there. But if we can manage the rainwater, send it off, send that high flow off into uh, basically a stormwater basin, we can allow that stormwater to infiltrate into the soil or be used as irrigation water too. Uh, farm so with the mortality, I uh, won't go too, too much into this, um, but just a, a nice simple example of uh, what we're looking for when we're talking about the above ground composting of uh, mortalities. We're looking for a nice thick layer of high carbon material, so a lot of brown material underneath and then on all sides of the animal. So typically we'll see about two feet on, on all directions. And about the two feet mark is where that carbon does an amazing job of capturing odor. Uh, so if you've ever had the carbon filters or anything like that, um, even just a little example by if you were to get uh, uh, some uh, some fresh manure, fresh compost uh, for your yard, and it was a little bit too smelly, you could just run back to the store, grab some straw, put a thin little layer over that over the smelly smelly parts. Uh, that carbon does an amazing job of taking away the odor. So putting that carbon around uh, around the animal, it can absorb a lot of odors, preventing a lot of the predators from coming in and trying to take it out. Um, the reason we've been going with the composting aspect is largely because of, because of our high water tables in there. So we've got a lot of seasonal and high water tables with our soils. And so we're trying to keep some separation distance between the actual water table and also the seasonal high water table. So we can get that spring melt and all that water moving through the soil under underground. Uh, we're trying to keep that water isolated. So if we move into the, the product materials, uh, again, similar tools to the trade here. We're looking for tanks, we can go with septic systems, and we've also got um, municipal systems as well. Not often used, but some of our farms, it has been an option. So, easiest thing to do is if, uh, if there's a, an existing liquid manure system, you can just integrate the, the production water right into that manure water system and everything's captured. But um, some of our smaller farms where they don't have that extensive of a manure system, uh, we can turn to the septic system. So, the septic system is specifically designed for uh, fat soils and grease. And that's just a little bit different. Probably people here that will know more about it than I do. But it's got a different set of baffles in there that can capture the fat soils and greases. So it does take some consistent management. Uh, the farms that have these types of things on their production waters, they're very really happy with them, but only when they are very, uh, very consistent with their management. So they will just regularly schedule the septic system to come out and do regular pump out. On the high, high production farms, it'll be about once a month. On the lower production farms, it'll be about once a year. Uh, it's probably, probably more common. Um, on the smaller farms, uh, they say that the once a year is probably a little bit too too soon or too frequent. But just having peace of mind uh, that that system is working the way it's intended, uh, it, uh, they, they feel it's worth it. So the last one here is again trying to keep the clean water clean, so we can use diversions, waterways, pipes, and gutters. <coughs> Trying to keep that keep that clean water flowing downhill. Some simple things. Uh, we use a lot of French drains out there, rock lined waterways, uh, armoring on the surface, and then the gutters. So we, we do have a lot of area on there. Uh, gutters are nice and simple, they're easy to describe, but they're a little bit harder to keep hanging, especially when you've got equipment moving around a lot of the area. Uh, so we do see a lot of a lot of gutters come off. Uh, we try to be, uh, we try, we're trying to be a little bit smarter about uh, where our vendors are prescribed. Uh, we have a nice high roof line. Um, there's also a factor of how many different people are working on there. So the owner tends to be a little bit more careful about the vendors and buildings. If there's a, a high turnover of employees working on there, we do see a little bit high incidence of use of vendors. All right, so now that we've captured everything, what do we want to do with it? We're looking for that reuse portion of it. Uh, there's a lot of good things in a lot of these materials that have been captured. There's an organic material that's very valuable uh, for the soils and the biology. There's a the microbiology, all the bugs, the microbes, 
products that are in manure products and wastewater products. There's a lot of trace minerals that the plants need for their uh, growth and production. Uh, the liquid the water value of that can actually pretty, be pretty helpful. Um, there's just this past season that we used, to, used that as, as an example uh, from mid-June mid or so all the way through August. Uh, not a lot of rain. People were really looking for some water. So those uh, the dairy farms that did have those liquid manure systems, they could put that liquid manure back out onto their grass fields and try to keep that grass growing just a little bit. So we did pretty well. Uh, then the last thing is just the fertilizer value. Again, you've got that nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that's in there. It's uh, readily available. It's easily broken down by the soil microbes out there. And when the soil microbes are eating all those cells, breaking that stuff down, eating that cells, but releasing that nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and uh, it's ready to go on the next one. Uh, that last, last part down here, uh, we do run into situations where a farm is growing more animals than they have and they have feed that they're growing with animals. So if they're out of balance between the amount of land that they have that's available for manure application, then we'll start to look for some alternatives out there. We've been pretty fortunate in that so far we've, we've been able to find outlets for all these things. But, um, but as, as a state, as a whole, we are actually producing more nutrients than we have land for them. So this is, this is a little bit of a larger problem uh, quickly working on solutions. All right. Um, the way that we find that balance on there is that we will test the manure for its NPK value, we'll test the soil for its NPK needs, and then we'll just balance the two of those. Uh, so most most frequently, we'll be prescribing set amounts of manure for all of the fields. It is a little bit difficult for the farmers to, to try to change their rates, so as, if we can stay as consistent as possible, we'll try to find a nice, nice level playing field that the farmer can, can regularly play on, on finding the farmers. Uh, so just in terms of if a farm is uh, has some waste products that are leaving the farm, uh, that are leaving the land, and they might need some help, there are <coughs> organizations out there that, that can offer some help. Uh, if, if, if only ideas, um, ideally some, some grants as well. The USDA does have a number of grants uh, that go out there for some of these things. The EPA also has some grants out there for the creation of uh, The Department of Agriculture is very good with going online with some pretty neat stuff. We're excited to see what happens with that. Uh, DEP has been really helpful in terms of uh, the Water Permitting Division and the Watershed Planning Division uh, work with the 319 funds, and so we've been able to collaborate on this project with them. Then the RCD is doing a lot of stuff with uh, soil health and uh, soil management out there. Uh, we've got conservation districts, we've got the University of Connecticut, so it's doing really neat stuff. Uh, so there's, there's a number of different places out there uh, to turn to for help. And uh, I'm going to come back to this slide in just a second. I'll just finish up with, I think it was the last one. Uh, so again, just specifically for the USDA program, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, Natural Resources, have what we call an EQIP program, EQIP, another acronym for Environmental Quality Incentive Program. And this is the one where farmers can go to NRCS and apply to the system, and then there's a pretty good sized application process. But if there are things that need to be fixed, so you can apply to this program to do some environmental fixes on the farm. Uh, the, the downside of this program is that it is a, a reactive program. It's designed to help existing problems. It is not designed as a proactive pro program, meaning that a farm wants to not make a mess ahead of time. Um, this, this program is not very well for that. So, uh, if, there, if there is an existing pro uh, problem, they can go to this program, this farm work program, and it's not for that. Um, so that was my last slide. Um, before I finished up, though, there was just uh, one person I did want to introduce. I mentioned the DEP. And so uh, we do have one person back here that's uh, helping out with some of these uh, farm program stuff. And uh, I will let her introduce yourself. Hi, everybody.
Uh, my name is Robin Long, so I work for Connecticut DEEP. Uh, most of my work experience is actually in industrial wastewater, um, but my predecessor, Joe Budman, retired after three years earlier this April. Um, I now have agriculture. <laughs> so a lot of people like to call me the new Joe Budman, um, but my name is actually Robin Long. Um, I've been working with Jim since about April, kind of just learning a lot of the ag program and getting up to speed. Um, but I may or may not be your contact. Uh, I think moving forward, if you're on a farm and you see impacts for water quality, please let us know. Um, again, my name is Robin Um That's about it. Happy to take questions if anybody has questions. Yes? Oh. Last chance for questions from Dr. Jim. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay. Okay. I'm going to uh, get us right into two more to go. I'm going to hop us right into the next one. As you all know, you know our ideal surface for you know infiltrating. I'm going to turn off my emails. Uh, the ideal land use for water quality is forests. So you know again, in, in sort of broadening the scope of, of what you folks look at, uh, we thought it was really sort of beneficial to have someone talk about forests, talk about forestry management, and how that could be sort of embedded into sort of the broader look at watershed the watershed survey program. So I'd like to introduce from MBC Andy Hubbard, who is going to talk about MBC's watershed management program. Okay. Spacebar, or we can put the mouse. Uh, this is the slide that they see. Yeah. So just hit it. Uh, okay. All right, guys, I'll try to make this brief, pretty hot here, and I'm getting ready to go. Looks like everybody's getting a little tired out there. Um, first, I'll start out with a couple slides on the forest management that we do up at NBC, and then I'll get into some stuff that might help you with specters uh, as you're out the field that you might come across forestry operations. Uh, within your watershed. Uh, so I'm a forester for NBC. I'm responsible for managing about 30,000 acres of land, about 25,000 in Connecticut, 6,000 in uh, Massachusetts. And the goal of the program that we run out there is to provide the cleanest water for our water treatment facilities. Watershed forests are, as uh, Eric said, the pretty much the most desirable land use for protecting drinking water. It's fairly obvious, it provides a natural filtration system, buffers pollutants, Intercepts runoff, you know, moderate stream flows, all of that. So forest is forest is a good thing. We do have a forest management plan on our property. Um, we have the entire property broken down into blocks and stands and management units, and we have prescriptions, all kinds of different prescriptions uh, throughout the property. And really, the, the main benefit of the plan is that it does help us establish priorities. Unfortunately, as soon as the plan is completed. There's some new insect disease or storm that comes in this, and we kind of have to go through and, and edit the plan. I've spent most of my career um, chasing various insect and disease outbreaks and mopping up after like you know 24 inches of heavy wet snow on Halloween back in 2011. So yeah, although we have this great management plan based on the latest science in black cases, we're not able to follow it because there's other things that are more urgent that, that crop up. The goal of watershed forest management basically is, is a healthy, diverse forest ecosystem. I want a diversity of age classes and a diversity of species. That gives me the most stability. Um, that helps me prepare for whatever next because we don't know what's next. We don't know what the next insect is. We don't know when the next hurricane's going to hand. So we feel like the more diverse our property, our forest is, the more resilient we're going to be for the, for the next thing. But that age class is, is, is and species composition is great. A quick picture of a timber harvest. I know there's a couple of foresters in the room, you'll sort of recognize this. This is shot kind of high, but it's regeneration shot. Uh, on the left, 
2015 picture is right after um, that was cut, and on the right is about six years later. Um, in that picture, I can make out some little oaks, some birches, some maples. I know there's a couple pines tucked in that stand somewhere. So we've been, we've been pretty successful with our timber harvest in terms of regenerating native species. There are no invasives in this stand after that cut. So we're, we're pretty fortunate we have a fairly minor invasive species problem up in our camps dead area. Number one forest product for us is clean water. Pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, we do do a number of commercial scale harvests every year, generate some income. We're talking, you know, several hundred acres of harvest a year. Most of our crews are mechanized. Uh, lots of for lower ground pressure machines, like the harvester uh, pictured in the bottom. Uh, all of our foresters, NBC, and all the waters that work for us are state licensed. So it's, 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 it's been a pretty successful program. Uh, we've had a forester on staff at NBC continually since 1947. So we've got one of the longest histories of really good forest management within the state. Each one of our projects, whether it's we've got some of our construction repair guys in the back, whether it's one of our own in-house projects replacing all the pipes and, and grading service roads, or if it's a commercial logging operation, uh, we have about a half a dozen of these oil spill kits, which are on each site. Um, we use them all the time, unfortunately. I thought all those had a tendency to blow, especially forestry equipment. So within those kits, we have, you know, toilet absorbent pads and booms and essentially speed noise, essentially catheter or down pocket. So if some of those blow homes, they can immediately, you know, clean it up before it becomes a larger issue. So each one of our vehicles in water supply, including our police officers, have spill packs, smaller spill packs, but spill supply kits within those vehicles. Uh, we do a yearly training uh, on spill that all the water supply staff attend. We, we take it we take it pretty seriously. One of the management challenges that we have, which probably all of you who own and manage forest land have, is deer browse. Um, deer like to go through the forest and sort of eat the trees that we like the most, it seems like. If they would sort of browse uniformly across the forest, it wouldn't be so bad. But they'll select certain species and essentially eliminate those species. Um, in the bottom picture, you'll see a stand uh, that Basically, they eliminate any regeneration. The only thing in there is farm. So that's what can happen when you have too many, too many deer on your forest. We started a hunting program in 2009. Uh, it's been very successful. You can walk around now and find oak and sugar maple, and poplar, all kinds of stuff. Before we started the hunt, we had a lot of fur, beech, black fir, stuff like that. So the, the deer kind of greatly affect the ecosystem. I've long said that I think one of the biggest impacts my generation of foresters can have is to reduce the deer population and regenerate the forest to native tree species. And you know, I'm going to go down swing on that point because I spent most of my career uh, working on those two things. Quick picture of one of the strategies we've used for deer our deep pond watershed, which has a little bit more residential population. Uh, we do have some deer hunting down there, but it's a little tougher with a lot of houses surrounding our properties. Um, on the left hand side of at least my screen is uh, grasses, weeds, and fur. That's outside the fence. You'll notice inside the eight foot high box fire fence, there's trees that are already six foot tall. That's at the end of the second row of the season, row of that comes. That's how much the deer can retard the growth of the forest. It's starting to catch up now, but it's five, six, seven years later. The species composition outside of that fence is significantly different than the species composition inside the fence. There's absolutely there's certain species that are just not present outside the fence, although they should. We didn't fence the entire area in as part of a study we have the atmospheric station that board has a series of plots inside and outside the fence. We're plotting the regeneration species composition and size against each other. And inside the fence is, is quite favorable um, compared to outside. I know Regional has built a couple of these. This is a slash wall in NBC also at the Pond Reservoir. We basically took a technique Cornell University came up with and took brush from the timber harvest and piled it along the perimeter of the timber harvest to keep the deer out. We've got a couple gates so we can get in there. Same as the deer fence. We have plots inside and outside the slash wall. Um, that slash wall was completed in March. There's already oaks inside the slash wall that are that tall, and the oaks outside the slash wall are below the eye. There's also clearly already a difference in species composition between inside and outside the slash wall. So deer, although we are hunting the problem, this 
property. Deer are still an active property. Um, I like to look at a wildlife picture. That's a little moose that was following me for several months while I marked this timber sale. Transitioning quick to what watershed inspectors probably should be looking for if you're out doing inspections and you see a timber harvest and you're not sure what's going on with it. First thing I would recommend is contact the land use department. Although most forestry projects, most timber harvests are, do not require a permit, they are required to notify the town. So my notification to the town is usually like a, a one page write up of the project, couple maps, soils map, map of the access system. And I often invite the wetlands agent out to take a walk on it before we start it. And then I notify the wetlands agent when we start the project. Um, and you know, once you're at the land use office, you can see if the project has a potential impact to your watershed. You know, the, the whole property might be high and dry, might not be that big a deal, or there could be a couple of stream crossings, landings right next to a major tributary to one of your reservoirs. You're probably going to want to, you know, look into it. Uh, make sure you guys are doing a good job. Um, I, I would not walk onto the site without contacting them first. Um, I definitely would contact the forest care charge for the logger if you can, and preferably through the town wetland agent. Um, loggers are a little bristly. They don't like people just showing up unannounced, walking around their properties. It's, it's not a great idea. So I would definitely schedule a time. If you're concerned about the project, schedule a time to meet with them and, and take a look and make sure that they're doing following the proper BPs. And of course, hard hat and high risk clothes are absolute necessity. Um, I have a copy of it here. That's the state's forestry BMP manual. It's got a ton of really good information in it. It's very simple to pick up and read. I've got the link to it on the DEP's website, but it, it covers basic stuff like regulations, log lighting, skid trails, street crossings, you know, erosion and sediment control techniques, and hazardous materials, that kind of stuff. So it's really good publication, really quick read. You can pick it up, look at it for an hour, and then go out and walk an active timber harvest and have a pretty good idea what you're looking for and what's going on. So very helpful. You guys have harvest pop up in your watershed. I would definitely uh, go to DP's website. I don't know if these are still in print or not. Everything seems to be going electronic these days. Uh, log landing, first thing I do when I get to a log landing is just check for like fuel storage, hazardous materials, that kind of stuff. Some guys like to leave five gallon buckets, hydraulic oil laying around. Just, that's very similar to your construction site. You, know, you walk in, they've got fuel tanks mounted on their trucks, bar oil, the whole game. And I'm, I will not allow anything to remain on site overnight. And I want it better in the truck. I didn't want to see five gallon bucket on the ground while they're working. I want it in the truck, you know, in, in, after they're top of hydraulic oil or whatever. Also, check the tracking pad. Nobody wants to put a bunch of them on track to the ground. So, pretty, pretty simple. The landing is very similar to like a standard construction site you guys are used to inspect. Street crossings are another thing that's pretty common on forestry operations. In most cases, we'll use portable skitter bridges that just basically lay the bridge across the street. Drive over it, we're done, pull it out. In most towns, skid bridge does not require a wetlands permit because it's not considered fill, it's a temporary thing. Just lay it on the stream, go, pull it out. Very simple. Uh, post harvest stabilization, same as a regular construction site, except the silt fence typically isn't super helpful. We use more like hay bales and straw bottles and grass seed. The little bottom graphic is out of one of the forestry BMP manuals, and that's just like a recommendation on the spacing on those water bars. The top left picture, you can see those sort of little speed bumps kind of. Those are basically water bars. So at the end of this project, those speed bumps or water bars are installed to divert the water off the soil surface. Um, but the sort of tough thing with forestry stuff is while the project is going on, it's very hard to have any real BMPs in place. So kind of while the harvest is happening, you, you are at a little bit of risk to erosion if you get some heavy rains. If I see heavy rains coming, like they're talking over this weekend, I've got one active crew right now. I got to put a couple of quick water bars in on a couple of slopes just to hold it to get us through the storm. And then when they're done with that stretch, I'll have a little permanent water bars and we'll see them hang and put it to bed. So we'll get that done before they finish the project. The second they're done with a steep slope, we'll have that put to bed just so I don't have to worry about it. Now. And I think that's about all I have in terms of uh, inspection and things like that for you guys. Any questions for Andy? I just one quick question. Sure. That was really interesting. We have the front, we have forest management plans for our watershed forest tracks, yep. but it's specifically for timber harvest basically only. Yep. 
So what would you recommend? That was really neat about the deer and the pet to help with the diversity. What would you recommend would be the one next level, which I want to get to with our forester, who's an external forester, to put into our plan, what would be the next thing? Well, I mean, it depends sort of what your objectives are if you're, and, and, and where you're at, like age class-wise and all that. I mean, are you to the point where, and most of NBC's forest is well over 100 years old. In most cases, like not an overstory trees are 130 to 170 years old, if you can believe it. So we're at the point now where we're doing regeneration cuts. So we're doing heavy cuts. And so with the heavier cuts, if you're just doing more like intermediate cuts, if your forests are more like 70 to 90, and you're doing intermediate cuts, you're taking out you know, 20%, 30%, that regen isn't a thing. We're taking out better than 50% on almost every harvest we do because we're at kind of the end of the line with a lot of our trees and we're looking to regenerate. And in a lot of cases, so much forest health stuff. I've sat with millions of board feet of ash in the last 10 years. And those were heavy, heavy cuts. And if you do a heavy, heavy cut and don't do anything with the deer, you get nothing. Nothing's going to come. Right, out. I never thought of that. So it so, depends. The answer depends on the age of your forest. And the intensity of the harvest that you're doing. Right. You know, so if you're ramping it up and doing a high intensity harvest, you're going to have to address the deer if you're going to have any success at all. The guards don't. We have harvest going on all the time. So that's a good tip. Thanks. Yeah, and, and in a lot of cases, there's sort of some of these foresters are kind of old school. All they ever did was these like intermediate thinnings. Yeah. And I ran into that when I got to NBC. We have 75 years of intermediate thinnings. Uh -huh. And I'm like, wait a minute, look at this place. It's yeah. way too old. We're going to start to regenerate this place. In order to regenerate it, you need to knock the deer population down. So it's, it's been a struggle to get that through. And I think a lot of people were just sort of on that. We'll just keep thinning kind of, you know, yeah. mentality. So that's. A good chance that might be where. Do you look at wildlife recruitment at all? Yeah, we do, do a do. ton of work with DEP. You do. Okay. Noise, tail, grouse, I mean, all kinds yeah. of stuff. DEP loves me. They follow me around the wildlife guys. <laughs> Not those are foresters, but they're yeah. wildlife guys. I love me. Just, we do a tremendous amount of that. Oh, yeah. 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 Peace out on the phone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That was really interesting. Any other questions? So, how does it work for you, Yep. Uh, what's the composition and dimensions of those? Are they, is it just like a little firm and dry? Yeah, so the early slash walls that Cornell came up with that the Arnott Forest was 10 foot high, 20 foot wide, and, six, and their, their terminology is sufficiently dense enough to exclude deer. So my wall was 10 foot high, 20 feet wide. It's hard to compress already. And it's that she was wanting to try to get over it. Cornell's currently doing experience, experiments with smaller walls to see if that helps. I mean, there's really no reason for a deer to try to jump this wall. How they could. There's really no reason for them to try to push through it. So it, it seems to be working well. I've had the trail camera up since the beginning of March when we finished it. I haven't had a single deer on there. I know coyotes want to find a trail camera, not on deer. It, it's working well. I mean, there's literally a bridge at that high all over the place inside the wall and outside the wall. Anywhere from high to maybe knee high. Oh, no. And it's only going to get worse because during the winter, you know, February, March, the deer hammer for the generation. They've got other stuff they need now. There's grasses now. Maybe there's some acorns. I don't know where they are, but there's some formation stuff. Once you get a bunch of crosses and snow, there's nothing for the deer to eat but seedlings. You get, you know, that much snow and the seedlings sticking up that high, those deer would camp out and eat every seedling out of the area. How big the area is. It's 100 acres, it's 1,000 acres. They'll eat every single for those that are interested, you know, if you're, if you're looking at a deer hunt on your water company land, um, we've never denied a recreational activity permit for deer hunting in DPH, and then you would work with DEEP on the actual program to do the schedule of hunting. Yeah, and D, D, DPH and DEP have been fantastic with our deer hunt. There's a tremendous amount of help from DEP's wildlife division. Uh, we have over 150 hunters a year. We have over 10,000 acres. We've opened up since 2009 on hunting. And it's, been, it's been a big success. We have no accidents. Our officers have written virtually zero tickets. Uh, hunters have been really great, and DEP has been super supportive. I know it's sometimes polarizing, but it's a very, very yeah, anybody who doesn't believe it, it comes as one of my platforms in here. That's as, as clear as day. Thank Good. you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, last one. Uh, we save this one to last so that every single one of you will have to deal with this issue. Uh, next up, Sean Merrigan, in house DPA's employee. Uh,
expert extraordinaire in septic systems. He's going to go through the design. I'll show you some pictures of what might be of concern. Um, this is the slide they see. That's the next slide. Space party. Space party. Space party.
public sewers or the city of your house or your property, you need to uh, usually install a septic system. So it's an on-site septic system that would be connected just to that one building. And uh, so that would be what we do. So sewage disposal via public sewers. So about 60% of Connecticut is connected to public sewers, which is about 2.2 million people. Um, that's mostly in urban areas and areas of high density development. So cities like Hartford, Waterbury, mainly public sewers are connected to all the buildings that we see when we're driving around. However, you will find from areas of cities like Hartford, East Hartford, that still have a couple septic systems in areas that may not have sewers in that area yet. So uh, there are septics here and there, but mainly they're in the rural areas. And they serve about 40% of Connecticut, which is about 1.5 million people. And that also includes the alternative treatment systems and large systems that are in the DEP jurisdiction. So the site has a system that's over 7,500 gallons a day or higher. That's going to go to a DEP for a permitting process. And I use the term AT systems, alternative treatment. That's a system that treats the wastewater to a higher degree. It's usually treating uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, VOD, you know, using some kind of mechanical treatment. And that also requires a permit from DEP. So what is an outside septic system? More or less, it's the uh, piping and plumbing from the house that receives all the domestic sewage. The wastewater goes into a septic tank, and inside that septic tank, there's a treatment, you know, there's a treatment uh, train going on inside there. And then from the septic tank, the water will go to the leaching system, or a drain field, or uh, wastewater recycling system. There's a lot of different terms for it. We call them leaching systems. But the water will go to the leaching system and then percolate through the system, through the soils, and hopefully receive a high degree of treatment before it gets into the water table or to ledge or to a, a broker stream or the ocean. So that's the purpose of the septic system, providing treatment to wastewater on site. We do, uh, part of the septic system again are the septic tanks. So we do have two different types of tanks. We have plastic tanks and we have concrete tanks. Both tanks are approved through the states. We have to review the specs on these tanks. Um, uh, obviously the plastic tanks probably have the advantages, disadvantages. One of them is the lighter, so you can transport them to areas that you can't get a boom truck in, but like if you have to deliver a concrete tank to a site. However, if you have a high water table on the property, you gotta make sure you're gonna deal with anti-warranty issues. So plastic tanks definitely are um, something newer that we're seeing. We see a lot of them being used, but you gotta be concerned about the water table and insulation uh, problems with these. And generally speaking, the, the prices are pretty similar in the, in the, in the tanks, plastic versus concrete. So how does the tank work? Uh, wastewater from the septic tank will come from the building into the first compartment of the tank. Most tanks in Connecticut, all tanks now that go on the ground in Connecticut for septic systems have to have two compartments. There are older tanks that have one compartment. There's not a wall in the middle. The newer tanks have two compartments. And, and the purpose is water comes in from the building into the septic tank. Um, the, the, the solids and the heavier material is going to settle off to the bottom and create a sludge layer. In the uh, floatables, the greases, baking products that are lighter than water, they're going to float up to the top and create a scum layer. And then in the middle, the clear liquid will move over to the second compartment. And in that second compartment, you still have the same settling and floating process going on. So you get a few different uh, layers of treatment inside the septic tank. And even at the end of the septic tank, Inside the outlet valve, there's a filter inside. It's hard to see on the picture, but there's a filter in there. It's a screen device, and that'll hopefully retain any solids that get through the tank before they get out to your leaching system. So that's the uh, how a septic tank functions. And so wastewater from the septic, the septic tank is now going to go to a leaching system. And the leaching system is basically a subsurface system that's meant to uh, dispose and disperse the wastewater onto the soils below ground to a point where it doesn't hydraulically overload the site and it provides enough surface area to provide treatment to the wastewater. And on the left is a picture of a system going in. And on the right is a picture of a system that's almost finished. Um, on top of the system there's a material called filter fabric. That's a, it's a, a material that keeps silt and find from getting into the stone or into your leaching system. And once the system is uh, inspected and approved by the local health department, 
then they get the green light to go ahead and put topsoil on the system and then seed it. Question? What's the leaching product on the left? What's that again? What's the leaching product on the left? Uh, probably an infiltrator product or a Coltec product. It's a plastic unit that's hollow. I got some other pictures of uh, leaching products. So some of the products in Connecticut, the concrete galleries, which have been around for years, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're more expensive, but they're robust products, and they're good for like driveways and parking areas, areas where you might want to drive heavy machinery. So um, use quite a bit in Connecticut, and that's a concrete gallery install. And what that is, is the uh, systems of the ground, it's surrounded by stone, approved uh, stone that we stuck out in Connecticut. And once the system's inspected by the locals, the same thing, filter fabric to go on top of the stone, and then they can backfill the system. You know, stone trenches, they've been around for years. That's a, you know, a, a traditional system, but they're still used occasionally. And that's just a stone trench with a pipe in it. Uh, leaching pits, um, they, they, can, they can be in the form of concrete or plastic, but usually they're more of a high profile system than taller. So to use one of these on a site, the water table has to be fairly shallow, I'm sorry, fairly deep to use these types of systems. So I don't see these too, in too many uh, places anymore. Uh, classic units, these are, uh, we have three companies that have products in Connecticut that are approved. And then we have proprietary systems. There's a couple of companies in Connecticut that have uh, patents on these systems and basically these systems get a pretty high degree of credit for leaching systems. So there's demand to use them. Um, you can put less system in for residential and commercial development. Uh, but there is some uh, experience that you have to have to install these that are required. The little TVs to put in, you have to make sure the person that's installing it has experience or is trained to do so. Yeah. Here's another product. This is a Geomatrix product. And the way this is put in is it's a metal frame. You got to rent it from the company and you got to put sand in every other unit. And then they change a capsule and then they put stone in every other unit. So there's a, again, there's a technique to it, but there's also an advantage. You get a high credit for these types of products. So these are something that we approve at the state. All right, and then the, uh, the last one, I'll show a picture of the cesspools. Cesspools have been around for years, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. They're no longer allowed in Connecticut on repairs, but there are a lot of houses that still have cesspools. And basically, a cesspool is an excavation of the ground. It can be surrounded by stone, brick, um, concrete structures, plastic, but it doesn't have a septic tank in mind for the unit. So basically, it's a straight pipe from the building, directed sewage directly into that cesspool. So all the solids and paper products end up in that, in that cesspool. So if, you, if your house has a cesspool, they can keep using it, but once it fails, they cannot replace it with another cesspool. And these are usually replaced during real estate transactions. So if you're gonna buy a house, you have a septic inspection dive, there's a cesspool on it, you probably won't buy that house until they upgrade the system. Unless you really like the house. So long. Um, are those kind of common campgrounds? I think we have like campground in our water shed where there's like a bunch of those types of like cesspools where the long term camping units. Should it be? They might be holding tanks. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. It's, that makes sense. I know they're outdated in the rows. Well, they're, they're also a safety issue because a lot of the cesspool covers, the concrete covers, the plywood on them, kids fall on them, people fall on them. Yeah. So, yeah, you don't see too many. All right, so we do have setback distances for um, septic systems to wells. You know, most residential wells are 75 foot minimum distance to the uh, septic system. There's distances to property lines, water courses, um, drains in the ground, whether it's a road drain or a foundation drain, you have to keep the septic system so far away from it so you're not getting that flowing into the drains um, and also buildings. And this is Kind of a just a drawing which you might see as far as someone laying on a septic system on a property, showing the setback distances to the house, to the wells, to the property lines, to a water course. We also have vertical separation distance requirements for septic systems, and they have to be no closer than 18 inches to the water table. So to install a septic system, the bottom of the leaching system can be less than 18 inches to the groundwater table. Um, if it's a large system, over 2,000 gallons per day, or if there's a fast park rate, or if it's in an area that's in the shoreline area, it's highly influenced, they have to have a, 
a minimum setback of two feet to the water table. So that's the bottom of the system to the water table. And then you have to be four feet above lead drive. So what does that mean? That's basically, a, uh, this is right out of a regulation. It's a cross-section of the leaching system. And it's just showing you a couple of things. You gotta be four feet from lead drive, 18 inches from the water table. All right, so those are requirements for newer systems. A lot of the old systems don't meet these requirements. So septics went in pre-1982, you know, pre our pre -our regulations. A lot of the systems might be sitting right in the water table, right on top of the ledge. How do we determine groundwater and ledge in Connecticut? Well, we would require that the engineer or installer goes out to the site with a sanitarium from the local health department, and they dig a hole on the site. And then they have to look for signs of a seasonal high water table. And you actually sometimes you have to get into the test pit, scrape the side with the shovel, and start looking for discoloration in the, in the side of the soil profile. We call it redox morphic features or bottling, different terms for it. We're trying to ascertain where the water table is. And you can, as you can see where those arrows are, you can see some discoloration in the soil, so that might be a sign of a high water table. And that's a water table that occurs during the springtime or heavy rain events. And the other option too is they can put stand pipes on site. So when you're driving, um, you know, by you know, farmland or vacant property, you might see a lot of these lots with these white pipes sticking out of the ground. They might be four inch pipes, six inch pipes. A lot of times those pipes are there for a reason. They put the pipes in the ground maybe six to eight feet deep. And what they do is during the wet season, which is by definition in Connecticut, February 1st to May 31st, they go out there every week and they look at the depth of the water table. They're trying out, try to find out okay, what's the actual height of the water table during the wet time of the year. So basically, a properly functioning leaching system to treat and disperse effluent into the surrounding soils without breaking out on the surface or polluting the ground. So ideally, that's what we want to see. But systems over time can fail, and they can also fail if they're installed incorrectly or if they're used incorrectly. So this picture right here is a uh, just a cross section of a trench, and the, you know the grayish color is the water thing. So in this case, this the system is fully saturated um, on the bottom and on the sides. There's a biomass that's formed. If those biomass form, they become too thick. Water can't move through the leaching system, and eventually it's going to move to the top and then possibly break out on the surface or create uh, in a lush green grass grow at the top. It might be uh, mushy at the surface, so you might have odors if you're walking by the area. So that would be a system that's not functioning any longer, probably, most likely failing. And this is a picture of what you might see. So if you're doing a watershed inspection, or you just drive around the neighborhood and see something like this, that's a good chance that it could be a failed septic system. Green grass, um, a lot of nutrients in wastewater, so the grass grows really well. You got, you got water in the so the grass, is, grass likes water, the grass is going to grow. And you possibly can't mow it because it's so wet over there. So the grass might get higher and higher. People that own the house or the property might just avoid mowing that area. So um, that's an indication of a failed septic. And then sometimes, you know, if the system is located on the side of a hill, it might not pile up as much, but it might just run down the property and possibly towards the neighbor's house. So obviously, if you live down low from the sky, and that's a failing septic system, you're not going to be a happy camper. So uh, the, the thing I try to point out is there's, there's two different terms for systems when they're having issues. One would be malfunctioning, one would be failing. Uh, malfunctioning system, so if, if an inspection is done on a septic system, and you got bad flow from the leaching field going into the septic tank after they pump the tank out, or if you got bad flow into a building, Someone's flushing the toilets and the water's not leaving the building or it's coming back into a sink in the basement. That, that's a sign of a malfunction of the system. Uh, areas of lush green grass, what we just saw. Sewage odors, potting surface water. That would be malfunctioning. And what, what, would, cause, what would cause a malfunctioning system? You know, there's many causes. You know, it could be excessive water usage. It could be too many people in the house. It might be a house here on college campus that's being rented out. You've got a lot of college kids there. Um, you might have a leaky toilet in the house, or something going into the plumbing that you shouldn't have. So water's put too much water flowing into the leaching system. You might have a clogged septic tank, effluent filter, uh, which is really a failure, but it might be an issue where you got a 
pump the tank out and clean the filter. You might have broken pipes out in the leaching system area or damaged septic system components. Uh, a lot of the distribution boxes that we use are concrete, and over time the concrete will spall and fall apart. And some of the systems will just fail during the springtime or during heavy rain events. So, and then water cycle. So those cause a lot of problems too. They can raise hazard in septic systems. So if the cause of the sewage discharge to the ground or the back of the house can't be corrected, then the system would be considered failing. And once the system is identified as failing, it's really the property owner's responsibility to hire a licensed septic installer to replace the system. And you know, if the property owner does not, sometimes they refuse to fix septic systems because of the cost that's associated with it. Then the local health department will probably have to issue an order to the property owner. And hopefully that order will get them to fix the system. If they don't, then they can take legal action. That happens once in a while. So I guess my point is, if the system, if you go out to a site and there's green grass over a septic tank, or there's ponding water, or something's going on in the basement, it doesn't mean it's failing. There might be something going on in the leach field that can be easily fixed. Versus something where the system's fully saturated and can't be fixed. So here's a, here's a picture of a, uh, there was a problem with the leaching system and water was not getting from the tank to the leach field. So they opened up the tank and they pulled out a, a weedy root, a weed, what do they call it, a root snake. Okay? So they pulled that out of the pipe going from the tank to the leaching system. So once they pulled that root out, the problem is fixed. They have to fix the leaching system. Water's now getting to the leach field. So that's a situation where it's an easy fix. The property owner probably saved a lot of money instead of replacing the entire leaching system. This is another failure where they went out and they dug a hole next to the system. And once they dug the hole, it filled up with wastewater effluent coming from the leach field. So that system was fully saturated. That's a case where you have to tell the property owner you got to put in the leaching system. The leaching systems are not cheap. Never were, and they're just getting more expensive with inflation. So not good news for the property owner, but it's the only option they really have. Um, and this was a picture of a system that was fairly new. It was only in the ground for one year, and there was only two people living in the house. So it was a really big leaching system. So you're scratching your head going, why did it fail so, pretty, so early, so soon? This was a case where they had a water softener treating the, the private well. It was connected to the plumbing in the house, so it goes to the septic tank. All the iron and manganese that was being backwashed from the system was going into the septic tank and then into the leaching system. So this is pretty much manganese and probably iron in there. And that clogged the entire system. So they had to replace the entire leach field. And in fact, we pulled out the filter on this tank. It looked like someone painted the outlet filter black. That's how bad this stuff was. So that's why we always stress uh, water softeners cannot go to septics. People argue about it, but it can cause a, a system to fail prematurely. Uh, the watershed inspection. So why are these important? Here's a, a map. I'm not sure how accurate it is anymore, but the gray, the bluish areas, the light blue areas, those are the public water supply watershed areas in Connecticut. The green areas, the bright green, those are areas that have public sewers. So anywhere that doesn't have public, uh, private, sorry, does that anywhere that doesn't have green associated with it, you probably have to use uh, on-site septic systems for wastewater disposal. So as you can tell, that means there's a lot of septic systems in these areas that are uh, watershed areas. So that's the point of a watershed, watershed inspection. Um, prior to performing inspections, we, we recommend that you notify the local health departments that you're doing so and uh, notify the public, whether it's through local newspaper, or send postcards, you, you can put something out on social media. So if you're walking around neighborhoods, people are aware of something, you guys are out there doing inspections. Uh, and also do your research, visit lo the local health department, and you can check property files for, in for information regarding septic systems on properties. A lot of these files, if there's a septic system on a the property, they likely have magical drawing. The file. That drawing will show you where the septic might be relevant to the well, relevant to the building. So uh, that way you can tell if there's something going on in the property and you think it might be a leaching system failure. You can see where the leaching system may or may not be on the site. Now look for the obvious signs of possible failure when you go out and do your inspections. 
this is a, an obvious sign of a failure right here. Not an old system. I think it was five years old. And the system runs laterally in the front yard. And on, on one end of the system, the far right side, water was kind of like short circuiting out of the side of the system. Moving down the front yard to the grass stream. It's a nice colored grass, but it's only in one area. So that was a possible septic system failure. And that, we weren't saying it was failing, but there's a side of malfunctioning going on. So this was a real estate transaction. And obviously the buyer of the house was concerned. They had the inspection done, the inspector pointed the out. So they get the buyer and the seller, everyone's out there trying to figure out what's going on. The system's only five years old. So they, there's a couple options, you know, they can negotiate a price on the house, to offset the cost of new septic. They can try to troubleshoot the system to find out what's going on. I mean, it's only five years old, and it was a pretty big system, so it shouldn't be having problems already. But you have the option to bring people in with the equipment to try to troubleshoot the system. And uh, they have telescopic cameras that they can run through cables. They can use these to locate sys uh, septic system components, the D boxes, the leaching systems. And those on the end, they actually have a camera you can take pictures. So if you run it through the leaching system, you can see how high the wire table may or the water might be inside that leaching system. And obviously, there's a cost associated with it, but it might be a lot cheaper than replacing a leaching system. So if the system was 80 years old and you think the system was failing, you probably just want to replace it. But if the system's five years old, it's probably worth the money to try to figure out what's causing the problems. Again, this is a site with a failed septic, and you know, in this case, the property owner didn't just let the grass grow. He kept driving over with his lawnmower, and he kept cutting the grass down. So good for him. But you can see the ruts in there. I'm sure the lawnmower can smell too good. Uh, I've seen sanitarians that go into property for the things as a failing system, and they'll do the stick test. They'll put the stick in the mud and smell it. it smells like sewage. It's probably a septic system. If it doesn't, it might not be a septic system. Dye testing on properties. We come across cases where we know there's a septic failure, especially in the shoreline area. There's a lot of houses close by, small lots. There's, there's something's something's happening. But you're not sure where, where it's coming from, which house. So you can do dye testing. You can put dye into the septic tank or the toilets and try to figure out where what house it might be coming from. Right? But again, you got to get the cooperation of the property owner to do this. So. <coughs> This is a, you think this is a failed septic system? <laughs> I would say it's malfunctioning. The tank failed, but the leaching system might still be working. So if they go out and fix the septic tank, the system might work fine. They probably ought to fix a long time. So, so that would not, not necessarily be a failing leaching system. Not yet. All right, this right here is a picture of, you know, people drive by and they go, oh, look at the grass, it's green, it must be failing. This is not a failing system. This is three rows, maybe four rows of the system in the ground. And it could be during the dry time of the year. And this year we had a lot of dry weather, so all the lawns are brown, dirt, um, if you were watering them. The, uh, so this is just an area where the leaching system has water in it from the house, which is normal. So it's just providing nutrients and water to the grass above it. So the grass is nicer. Does that mean it's failing? This might be uh, just an area where the system's working fine. Don't always assume if you see something like this, it's a failed septic system. Uh, this picture right here was not a failed septic system. It might look like it, but there's no septic over in this area. This is just, you can see some snow melt in the, in the picture. So it's probably the springtime of the year. Water table is probably high. Water could be moving on a uh, compact till soil, or it could be moving on ledge. And it's almost like a quasi spring where the water breaks out somewhere on the surface. So I've seen people issue orders to property owners for a failed septic when the septic system is not even close to where the uh, breakout is. So just keep that in mind. Uh, two, three. And um, obviously, the, you know, the obvious approach is if you smell it. So if you go to a site and you smell sewage, but something's going on, probably a failed septic system. You can check storm drains, catch basins, sometimes the system might not be breaking out of the surface, but it's getting into a nearby drain or catch basin. And a lot of times with the odor issues, who do you think is going to complain about the odors? It's usually the neighbors. So you got a house that has a failed septic system next door, 
and if you can smell sewage, you're probably going to contact the locals and say, hey, the neighbor's something might be found if you look at it. Uh, I think we're going to share. Inspection results. So we, I would recommend when you, when you do the inspections, if you come across a failed septic or a not possible failed septic, notify the local health firm of possible signs of septic failure and tell the location, the address, what you saw. Uh, if there's sewage overflowing onto the ground surface, and that warrants immediate attention, so they, someone should address that right away. Uh, document your findings and take pictures. Is, that is it. Any questions? It needs to go, so in our regulations, there's a whole section on uh, wastewater discharge dispersal systems. That's where it kind of has to go. Water softeners have to. Uh, there are some water treatment devices to go out and go into the septic system, but the system's got to be evaluated to make sure it's sized properly. So there's a few products that we allow. The water softeners are the most part of that. Um, and for seasonal high ground water, right? You can have like, you know, the test bits and the monitoring and all that. Is there a resource where data is available on seasonal high ground water to not just build up? Not specifically. Um, USGS just has a website, though, and they still have it. I'm not sure how much data they provide, but they can give you an idea of how high the water table is in certain parts of the state. You know, well, it's a different types of wells. So sometimes we'll reference that. When people do water, stamp by monitor, you see the water table is actually high enough statewide to accept the numbers. And then there's the NRCS maps, the soil maps, you can go online. That's not really going to tell you the exact water table. It's going to give you a range. You know, it might see, you might say expect the water table 18 to 40 inches on the site, but it's not that accurate here. But it's a good guidance tool to use. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? I can make differentiate between uh, like a soccer backwash system and a second. Are there other things that look differently from the low ground? So if they had a they had to drive on their song, how would they tell the difference between what they're seeing there in terms of probably I guess the question is how would you know the difference? You have to go to the record. Do you know that honestly just see actually done well, but I think they're done well there. Do DBH have guidance on like when I do development review and offer watch area or something like a big mixed use development and they are going to do their own septic system that connects to sewer? Do you have guidance documents that I can refer to? Because I don't know what's good or bad. So do you have those? You mean regarding the type of system? Yeah. So if they're saying, what do you do with septic system? So well, I just had a, I had a talk this morning with an engineer. He's doing a big stuff about it. Yeah. It's a building nursing home. They're turning it to a housing complex. Right. Yeah. It used to be a DEP site. Now they're going to change. DEP regulations, by the way, for septic systems are extremely costly and difficult. The review process is really slow. So a lot of times you take sites and try to chop them up to keep them under our regulations. That, that's what they're doing here. But they ask the question can we use a certain type of, type of product for this use? And all I can say is all the products are good. Okay. I might try to discourage them from something that's proprietary for a restaurant, but they still have the ability to use it. Okay. So somebody else is looking at that other than the watershed folks. Like it should go through the DPH or local health, go through the town. So I usually just depend on that and that's good enough. So we're setting back from the downtown to be that to be the town with guidance from them. Okay, so 75. Well, we review anything over 2000, we have to review the state. Small assistance to review it below the uh, Okay. I don't know if that's really you guys. Is this the water shaker? Any place of subjects? No. No, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a public health code of level setbacks that they have written in there? Um, is that specifically for public water supply wells, or does that ever apply, or would it apply to the wells that are uh, supplying drinking water for you? For septic or for um, or for the you know, backwash systems. I'm just talking about the well setbacks. For private or public, either one. 
But there's increased setback distances based on the wall rate of the Yeah. Yes, so it goes from 75 to 150 to 200 feet, depending on the pump capacity. So when you say private supply well, it can be used for anything, even if it's not human consumption? Now, there's a big change recently the private well and portable well definition. I don't know yet. Wait, you might have a definition for it. Uh, You're saying if it's like an irrigation well, it's down the same distances for Yeah, or if the well is for, to, for animal drinking water, do the setback still apply if it's not human consumption? My understanding is no. I know we have local health people here, so I'm from local health people. <laughs> well, I was reading about the farm house the other day and the farmer can dig their own well, but if they ever want that to be like a domestic global well, they have to have a licensed filter, filler, um, dig it and get a permit, um, like initially and a completion report and are signed by the sanitarian. Um, otherwise, it, they can never like switch it over, and then once they do all that, if they ever want to switch it over to a domestic portable well, then they have to go through the pH. Because that was kind of the one doing that right now. So can they control a well? They control a farm well, they still have to buy by the stacks. So they can't just put right in the potential leaching system, so that's going to set feet. But so they don't have to pull the farm well. So are those cut back specific distances from the subsurface system, or can it be from any source of pollution? Well, our, our regulations are just for the septic systems. Other sources of pollution are B-51 for private wells and for public wells. The B-51D yeah. uses the term other source of pollution. That would be for both private and public wells. And again, you're looking at 75 feet to the septic or an other source of pollution, which could be a number of things. That's about the regulation. Does that include like New York perhaps? Yeah, well, what you're doing is you're approving a site plan, right? So normally you wouldn't see a new pile in a site plan or in where a new well is going. You probably see that sort of after the fact. And that's what we have an issue where it's an existing well with a new pile. But yeah, if you have a, a went out and did an inspection of the property and where you had to stake in the ground where you're going to put a well or a new pile is going away, you can approve that. Yeah, that there's, there's a scenario about where trying to help I think it's for a 75 to send back for a well for a new barn. And that's the first time I've seen it apply to really animal operations. So this is confirming that's applicable. Right. Is that you can use that right for ag or not? Is the question. It would depend if it was for portable use or not. It would depend if the ag property owner developed their own source. We could talk after the yeah. plan, not on the property. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for Sean? We just let you know one thing. If, if someone's doing a septic repair of a property, a repair, a replacement of the existing system, they can't get 75 feet to the well. We can give exceptions at the state for that. So there's an exception process for a repair that only happens in this Russia. Okay, give me 30 seconds. Um, Thank you to all the speakers that are still here today. Thank you for coming. Your certificates are waiting for you on your way out. Unless you registered late or registered today, if you do not have a certificate waiting for you, you will just leave your name with Rich and we'll get you a certificate via email. Um, if by some miracle this recording actually works the way it was supposed to, we'll give you a link so you guys can you know, peruse this down the road. Um, fingers crossed. All right, thank you so much. You're done. Thank you.
Blake Bowles. Blake Bowles. Kathy Brenner. Jesse Burns. Ryan Carboni. Robert Corbo. Wes D'Angelo. Sarah D'Angelo. Which one? Peter. Oh, sure. There you go. Okay. Groton, right? Sarah. Mo from Groton. Carl Extreme. Anthony Faraka. Anthony Francis. Michael Fusick, Chris Gardner, Jeremy Gadiosi, Susan Gilson. I didn't see that. I didn't hear it. Brilliant part. Yep. Yep. Good to go. Very good. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your vacation. See you in a week. See you on Tuesday. Yeah. Right on. Thanks. Enjoy your long weekend. Thank you. Ashley. Yeah. 